Hello and welcome to Making Creativity Pay, the podcast where we speak to people in a range of creative industries about how they try and make a living from their work. This episode's guest is Mark Stedman, owner of Podcode. Mark has been in podcasting since pretty much the beginning and we talk about the future of podcasting, how to get your podcast off the ground, how he built up and sold a podcasting business and thoughts on pay what you want and pricing of online educational courses within podcasting. Start at the beginning with your, I want a better phrase, journey in podcasting. You know, how did, how did you get into it in the first place? I think timing played a huge role. I finished uni where I studied media and communications, which was basically for me, it was radio and internet, which, you know, 20 years on, I'm like, yeah, okay, obviously. (laughs) So I I finished that in 2004. That's when I, you know, when I I graduated. And that was the year that the term podcasting was coined. And it was when people were messing around with how they could deliver audio files, primarily audio files, in a way that they were basically attached to blog posts that someone could write a script that you would download to your computer that would sync your iPod with iTunes so every time you plug your your iPod in to sync it to iTunes this script custom script would run and it would check all of these different feeds to get to find out if they've got any new episodes and download the mp3 file and put it on your ipod uh, via itunes and um and that became podcasting and apple sort of ran with it steve jobs unveiled the new version of the itunes store i think in 2005 um all of this during all of this time i don't really know much about it i'm, I'm messing around with on-demand audio making just bits of music or or whatever while I was at uni I think I was playing around with like radio plays and and, and making radio shows and, and they were meant to be consumed on demand but we we knew then we had this idea in in the UK the BBC had what was then called I think the BBC radio player I think that was the name for it yeah um, which was just this like little pop out web player that, that would appear for, for a station that you were listening to and it allowed you to actually uh, their thing was listen again that was that was the term um, you could listen again to uh, a show that you'd missed and they had this this sort of catalogue that you could you could go through and it was you know like a little flash based player and stuff and I built one of those uh, for my uni project and so I, I started to get into what was available and over the years working with uh, within community radio stations I got into that kind of stuff but it wasn't until the beginning of 2008 where I thought okay I've listened to some podcasts now I now have an iPod um I was using a creative zen and <laughs> the creative company uh creative labs who used to make speakers and sound cards and stuff they tried to coin the term zencasts and they also tried to play off the idea that pod standard for personal on demand because they didn't want to acknowledge the iPod's role in this because their product was a competitor to the iPod. But yeah, I, I started listening to podcasts and then uh, beginning of 2008, uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to make one. I know, I know radio, he says. Um, And, you know, I made these six episodes and they were, you know, very bad. Not just bad quality, uh, but also bad opinions. <laughs> and, and, and also like, it wasn't a show that knew what it was and all sorts of stuff, but it got me enthused about it. And um, the next thing I started doing was building like a little mini podcast network. And uh, uh, and so, yeah, and then like y- years have gone by, I produced shows for for friends and built uh, a new network uh, around 2013 which which had a few shows in it and it's what i've described before as the world's most technically advanced podcast network that nobody ever listened to <laughs> they didn't have many listeners but the tech was great and i i was doing the the kind of stuff that we talk about in the industry now um called dynamic insertion uh, dun- like dynamic ad insertion where i was putting jingles and things in, in mp3 files and uh, and then yeah in 2016 I started working I, I got my first client um for to, to actually produce you know my first paying client I should say to, to do some podcast production after doing lots of volunteer work and um and building up my skills and stuff and started a podcast hosting company to do all the the, the tech stuff because that was my background because after having after leaving uni I instead of going into radio I went into into software development and um, so sold that company last year and now I spend my time helping people learn how to make podcasts and feel good about it and get rid of their imposter syndrome and and work over sort of work through those fears and and that kind of stuff and yeah that's probably all the time we have so sorry about that (laughs) (laughs) No, no no that's fine so I mean you know you've kind of been one way or another around the industry pretty much since the beginning do you feel the last two to three years there's been a big change there's been lots of those little 
little moments, little sort of flashpoints in, I think, 2008, 2009 is when the comedians arrived and invented podcasting. Uh, so Mark Maron invented podcasting, I think, in sort of 2008. And then, like, the nerdist Chris... Oh, I've forgotten his name now. Chris Hardwick. He sort of invented podcasting a couple of years later. And then in 2014, Serial invented podcasting. Um, and then in 2018... Anchor and Spotify invented podcasting. So there's there's been these moments where people have written the article, the same article several times about how podcasting is back. And people, I think, have stopped now starting articles about podcasting by talking about Serial. Uh, and I've got no no problem with Serial and it, it helps people understand what's, what's possible. But I think that 2014, that hit of Serial was the first time that people really started to pay attention and money started to arrive. In 2018, that's when... Spotify started to take all of this stuff really seriously and had furious acquisitions, you know, built sp- uh, strategic partnerships and stuff. So it's definitely changed in the last few years, but there have been these incremental changes over the over the last sort of decade really. I guess as someone who's had a hosting company, if someone came to you now and said, "Why don't I just use Anchor? It's free, it's straightforward." Is there kind of an answer? Is it, it depends? It sort of depends. Um, I, 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 it used to be very important to me to tell people not to use Anchor. It's less important to me now. I think there are reasons that it that I tend not to like Anchor because partly because of the free thing, but also because of the the, the tight integration with Spotify. More and more, they are defining podcasting for a new audience in a way that excludes actual podcasting because the problem with with spotify is it's not really podcasting we can get into the nuts and bolts of that but spotify's audio is in its own closed ecosystem they sort of borrow some bits from podcasting that that serve them uh, and and serve their their sort of their audience but they don't really play in the space as everybody else pretty much everybody else does and so because they've got this tight integration with anchor they are starting to do things that you can only do if your listeners are on Spotify and part of the problem is listening experience for podcasting isn't great on Spotify because the interface is never built for it and so I think you do your listeners a potential disservice but also you do yourself a disservice just because it's a free tool it's really basic there's lots of cool stuff you can do with other other tools that, that are available that allow you to that will allow you to grow a lot more and grow in a way that serves you rather than grow in a way that serves uh, Anchor and Spotify and 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 my my last point to that is there is this sort of keenness that that Anchor has to convince everybody that a podcast has to be monetized. Like it's the the very existence of a podcast means that you need to run ads on it. It's very important for for Spotify to to do that, you know, because it makes them more money. Um, and so they're they're spending a lot of money trying to convince people to run very unattractive and, and intrusive ads in their content for Anchor. So many podcasts start with an ad for Anchor and they're working with people who don't know that that's actually a really bad listener experience. And so, yeah, I, I think there's lots of little small reasons, but ultimately, if you know what you're doing and you just want to use it for media hosting and, and you know, you've got the rest sewn up, then, you know, there's no problem with it. It's just, I think there's a few tripwires to, to, be, to be aware of. If you looked at the crystal ball and said three years time, do you think RSS will still be the kind of dominant area or will Spotify just kind of hoover it up and it will be like you Google something, you Spotify a podcast? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think I don't think Spotify will be that ubiquitous. Um, I think there might be other platforms that will come up. Um, so I, I'm not going to be so bullish as to say RSS is going to be here forever. And and for anyone who doesn't know, RSS is the is the technology that podcasting exists on that allows it to be somewhat decentralized. So unlike YouTube, you don't have to upload it to one place. That's what Spotify wants. They want you to go to one place to upload your audio, and and it's it's consumed in the same way. Podcasting has existed for the last 18 years without needing that, and that doesn't mean it's always going to su- uh, survive like that. I don't think that Spotify, unless they make some drastic improvements to the way that their podcasting, the way they treat podcasts and the way that they're played and the way that they allow people to curate their own libraries and manage their libraries and stuff, I think they're only going to get, only going to be there for casual listeners. And that's 
fine and the casual listeners are mostly going to listen to the top 20 top 50 shows from mostly from the different NPRs that exist in America whereas there's still this huge long tail this huge bit of the iceberg underneath the water that is going to be on all of the other platforms and and whether that's Apple podcasts or or there's some new platform that comes up I th- I think yeah I I think there will be perhaps some kind of consolidation but I don't see it all being just towards Spotify I mean, it, it seems that there's a, there's a few a few of the big players are trying to do stuff. So, Audible, for example, you now as well as the audiobooks curate their own podcasts, and they also now fairly recently allow the ability to have just a general RSS type of podcast in there. Spotify buying an audiobook company, so they're all they're all trying to have a one stop shop, and whether yeah. anyone wins or whether there'll be some kind of balance, I, I guess we'll have to kind of wait and see. Yeah, and I think it makes more sense for Amazon with Amazon Music and well, specifically yeah, with Audible because it's the it's a similar kind of listening experience. Music and podcasts don't mix in the same way, and they don't have the same kind of needs. You don't listen to them in the same way. Whereas, to to a degree, uh, speech based stuff makes a bit more sense. I think to to combine into one app. I mean, what are your thoughts on kind of where RSS is hoping to go and podcasting two point and those those kind of areas? Do you think they're kind of trying to push against the tide or do you think that's going to take off? So whether that's chapters, transcripts, value for value, all, all those kind of things. I think they're pushing against a few different tides, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think I think we need people to, to push against the tides just so that it's not necessarily that we'll win, but that we put up enough of a fight. I'm a bit less strident about this than I, than I was. And I, I also think that we we need to accept that podcasting is going to evolve and the idea of what podcasting means is going to change and it is changing uh, and i think that's that's fine as long as as long as it remains open and as long as it remains somewhat decentralized i think we're in we're in the right the right spot and that's what podcasting 2.0 is aiming for it's t- to me it's relying too much on the blockchain um i i, I don't think that's the 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 way forward at the moment but I'm also prepared to believe that I might be a dinosaur about that, and uh, and I might, I, you know, I might be wrong about that, but I'm I'm not because <laughs> we're not ready for that. Because the, there's there's a there's a few things like the the you, you alluded to the value for value model. Um, that that's great if it's about real money. I I actually worked in podcasting on the blockchain for about six months, six or eight months on a project, and I still find it really hard to just to get you know money on a wallet or whatever it's it's not easy and so to assume that that's the it is not the future of how we make uh it's not the immediate future it's it may be the very very long term future but i think by then we're probably all in the metaverse you know there's there's probably various things so going back to selling podient um and and, and building it up um it's kind of thing one of the things you mentioned about you know kind of setting up a business building a business and then selling a business how much of your time and how was that like kind of all encompassing for what was it you say eight years oh uh podient was was only for uh it was about four and a half years and it was full time from 2018 up until march last well i keep saying march last year it was about um may last year uh, that was like absolutely full time but it was a it was a sort of a side project and, and a, a growing business from the um beginning of 2016 um yeah it was it was a sort of a bedroom side project uh that that then became it became a real business in a sense that um we never we we never had huge amounts of customers but we we absolutely played on the on the stage uh if you like um and that that was partly because of sort of being being opinionated caring a lot about the space um caring in different ways than I do now like I'm much more focused on creators and helping people express themselves in whatever way makes sense for them so being less as much as I've been quite strident about where I am with the blockchain and all that kind of stuff I I think with 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 Podient I was much more about this is the way you should do podcasting and it needs this that and the other um but it was it was a labor of love and it was um it was up until now i think you know it was the best thing i ever did i was so proud of it um and i i was on a a podcast recently 
talking about the the sale and the difficulty that I had was was how much I undervalued what I had. I didn't realize I knew I had a good product. Um and in some ways it outstripped a lot of the competition and I don't say that easily either. You can't see my face, listener, but I'm not the kind of person who says those kinds of things easily. Um I'm I I I have a big smile on my face, but it doesn't always come off on audio. I can, you know, I want you to know like I say that with as much humility as I can muster. I I was really sure that actually I did have a good thing, but it wasn't until I sold and then was like, okay, I've got a bunch of podcasts. Where do I put them now? That I was like, oh yeah, no, I I had a great service and I charged far too little for it, and which you know brings us beautifully to to getting getting paid for your creativity, I guess. Um, and so much of that is is down to being bold enough to say, I think it's worth more than. You know, maybe I think it's worth more than you think it's worth. Um, but be, you know, being able to 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 actually stand by your work a little bit more, um, and maybe be prepared to work with fewer people as a result, but know that the relationships you build with the people you do get to work with are gonna mean a lot more because they're not based on the fact that you were the cheapest. I mean, like you said, so one of the, one of the themes through the podcast, making creativity pay, kind of had Stuart Goldsmith on the first episode. I've recently recorded another one with someone who writes a beer website and has a beer podcast. And the problem in, in all these kind of areas is there's so much that's free. How do you justify asking for money? Now, I know, you know, you kind of say, well, you know, it's, it's a, there's value in the product. You, you do a number of podcasting courses. You know, I can get a crap or an average podcasting course for free somewhere else. You can probably get and, some you know, pretty use, good I'm, ones for free, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you'll say, you know, mine's better and worth the money. And but it's it's that leap and it's the same as, as any kind of thing. You kinda of say, Well, pay for my Patreon when there's millions of podcasts, free radio, whatever else. There's there's almost an infinite it's practically an mm-hmm. infinite amount of entertainment that you can get for free. Why should I pay for yours or, or your knowledge or anything else like that? Oh, is is that is that a hypothetical or do you want me to answer that one? Um well no, I mean in your case, you know, if someone said to you <laughs> Your stuff looks good, but I yeah. can get all this stuff for free, yes. you know, in the nicest possible way. Yeah. Why, why should, should I pay I... for yours? Completely. Um, so I think what I would say is um, come for the course, come for the course content, you know, come for the on-demand content, stay for the uh, Zoom calls that we have every couple of weeks, because that's where the, if you like, the rubber meets the road. Um, it's not in the content. The content is there to help and support you, to give you stuff, to, you know, like I, I'm working at the moment on how to take a course on how to take care of your voice with a, a the professional voice actor and a marketing one about building a listener avatar. That's with a marketing expert. Um, and that's great. And, and those, you know, you can consume that content and it's there, you know, 20 bucks a month, done. But where the value is, is after that is spending time on a zoom call uh for now it's you know fortnightly but we'll see where it goes and we had an amazing one literally two days ago as we record now where we brought someone on who actually wasn't a member of the community but who deserved to to hear what what we were saying because we were talking about a person who was struggling with with something um to do with their podcast and someone said like bring her onto the call just so that she knows that she's not alone so that she knows she's got support because I was her editor, her podcast editor. There's only so much I can do. Um, I, I want to be as supportive as I can, but, you know, there's only so much I can do when I also need to to sort of say, but I also need, you know, episodes to, to deliver for you. And so we were able to to bring this this person on and give her not just advice, but real support. And that is actually, it's much harder to sell that. And that's why I kind of say come for the courses. Like it's it's actually really hard to sell that because you it's something you really have to experience what it feels like to to know that your experience is somewhat shared or your pain is somewhat shared. And it's not necessarily that there are solutions, but there are people there who will talk you through or walk through the rough patches with you. And so the content is there, the the digital creativity is there as a way to to get into where we can where I can do the most good, if you like. So that's why that's why I would say yeah. you can pay. <laughs> and in terms of pricing, have you ever thought of a pay what you want model? Yeah, I did. Um, that's actually how I launched Podient. Um, 
it was it was on a pay what you can model. It was um, based on the the older definition of value for value, which isn't sort of Bitcoin related, but is simply about if I offer you value, as Adam Curry would say, um, you can pay that back in your time, talent, or treasure. Um, and I got that from a, a, a guy I like uh, a, a lot called Tom Merritt, is a, a sort of um, tech journalist who I follow, and I got that sort of that notion from him, and I kind of thought. In the spirit of that, in the spirit of can I offer something that is of use, and and if you if you like it, if you want to make use of it, then please do. The mistake I made is not setting a minimum, and so that meant that that for most people, pay what you can meant for free because pay what you can doesn't mean pay what you can. It means pay what you are, can get away with, and for a small amount of people, it will be pay what you think it's worth. But there will always be a, a, a great deal of people, and that's just the nature of the. This is just the nature of the world. There will always be a great number of people who will pay what, you know, if if they know they can get it for free, they'll get it for free, and absolutely that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so that's where I sort of you know got myself into a bit of a into a bit of a corner, um, because I I couldn't, make, you know, maybe there was part of me that just couldn't like put a number on it and say this is what I think it's worth. Um, so yeah, I, I I like the model and I've used it in other senses. I think it works really well for a piece of content, like a discrete piece of content that you deliver, whether it's an album or an audio book or whatever. Um, I think it's you know much more much more difficult if it's sort of an ongoing subscription or if your continued time is bound up with that. Whereas if you've made the thing um, and you're prepared to not necessarily make a fortune then being able to offer that i think is is it's it's you know yeah it's really good and and there's lots of services that kind of make that that nice and easy and so with people you work with and they say right i want i've got this podcast i want to at least help pay the bills Mm -hmm. um you know even the podcasting bills never mind the other the the mortgage and whatever else I, i just want to kind of have it as cost neutral say what would be your first step or what, what would you advise them to at least, at least try and get that 50 bucks a month back to kind of pay for everything i i think i would say that um it starts with the audience that that you uh that you're building and there are i mean you know i can say like yes there's patreon there's buy me a coffee there's all these different ways but you know that already the the difficulty i think is how you create something of enough value uh, or what you can give in exchange for that that patreon support and that's that's the difficult bit i i kind of think like monetization is actually really easy like monetization is is turning on a tap people think there's this big problem with monetization this big question of how to monetize that's actually not the problem the problem is how to get an audience that's motivated and enough of an audience that enough of that percentage it's in in sort of business terms or coachy type terms we think of this thousand true fans idea so you might have ten thousand subscribers probably more likely let's say you've got a hundred thousand subscribers but te- uh, but a thousand of those will buy everything that you have because they they love what you do and they support what you do if you're at a much smaller scale a hundred true fans is is absolutely fine if that's what it's going to take to help you pay pay your bills but it does mean that you've i think you have to build the audience and you have to demonstrate value for a and consistently i think you have to consistently show up for quite a while before you can start to ask for something back um i think you have to demonstrate the value um that you're that you're delivering before you start sort of asking asking for it back and if if you go into a project hoping that it can pay itself then you you need to sort of look at why at the motivation behind what it is because like i'm uh, I'm learning the guitar, so I've played piano. I've played piano for years, but I'm, I started learning the guitar a couple of years ago. I pay for lessons, forty-five minute lesson every week. I'm not looking like I'm. I'm not doing that because I want to perform. I'm doing grades because I want to know how well I'm doing. But I'm not looking to to go and perform. But I pay for lessons every week because I want to get better, and that's a hobby. And I sit and I noodle around and I enjoy it. I'm not looking to try and find my. Um, however much it is, twenty five pound a lesson, you, you know, f- feedback, um, because I'm doing that for myself. If I were doing that because I was going to make an album or whatever, um, 
or, or I wanted to go out and perform, I might think of that now as, a, as an investment that I'm making. And that's perfectly fine as well. So it all comes down to figuring out like why you're making the show, who you're making it for, and how you can demonstrate the benefit to the listener that um, that, that you're, you're going to be here for a while, you're going to be providing benefit and value to them. And hey, you know, at some point, if you get a chance, it would be great if you could um, send a little back my way. I mean, in terms of building a podcast... I mean, I kind of think of it almost like um, when you see in World's Strongest Man or whatever, they're pulling a, a jumbo jet. <laughs> you know, they struggle and struggle and struggle. It doesn't move. and they, But then once they get it moving, it's fairly free running. Mm -hmm. Well, not running, but, you know, at least pretty quick. I mean, do you kind of see it? The initial problem for people is, right, I put my podcast out. It gets three listens, say. You know, you, you get your, your mum, your nan, a couple of your mates, and, you know, that's about as far as it goes someone you work with you know maybe the next one gets to 10 but then how do you get to outside your immediate circle to 50 to 100 you know obviously step one is be good yeah. but you know beyond that it's um so a, a, a chap i work with had this great analogy which i've, I've put to use and i think it, it it makes a lot of sense. So if, if, if we're looking for people to to engage and consume our content, he likened it to being in a crowded tube station and if I throw out a ball for someone to catch, or if I say, hey, someone catch this ball, it's unlikely that anyone's going to catch the ball. But if I shout, hey, Steve, catch this ball, and my mate Steve's there, Steve turns around, he's going to catch the ball. He can then say hey, Jennifer, catch the ball, and turns to Jennifer, and Jennifer turns to him, and they catch the ball, and they move the ball back and forth. Starting by figuring out who you make your podcast for and then speaking to those people, and it's speaking to them individually, whether that's on Twitter, DMs, LinkedIn, email, WhatsApp, um, dropping them a text message, <laughs> writing them a letter or a postcard, whatever it is. If, if, you, if you know who you're making it for, then starting by saying this i reckon you should listen to this episode i reckon you'll you'll appreciate it because of this reason and it starts small it does start like that and then you're and you know you it, within that ask you say you know, listen to the episode if you like it please tell someone else that would be great but it has to be that you've got to start with with the absolute small scale you've got to start i think contacting people individually that is a, a you know if you are going from a standing start with no audience that is i think a good way to to begin is to actually say like here's a few episodes you you'll really like this one and then maybe a few weeks later you you're going to make another episode and you think of a particular friend that you want to make this for and and think of them as you're delivering the show as, as you're making the show think about like what they find funny or interesting and make your show put it up and then tell them and say i reckon you'll really like this because and i think chances are they will engage with that with that because they'll feel that energy they'll feel like oh yeah they're like we you know they know i like that kind of humor or that, that kind of topic um and just start be prepared to to, to start small in terms of discoverability and getting new listeners, because, I mean, one of the criticisms or possible downsides of podcasting that, that gets mentioned is the lack of discoverability, is that, you know, you can't chance upon a podcast where you might a song on the radio or a TV show that finit, that's on after the previous one you watched, you know, that kind of serendipity of, of things. And that's one of the things that's mentioned about Spotify and YouTube, where you've got more of a an algorithm involved. Do you think that would make a difference, or you know, if it's the kind of thing that's maybe going to appeal to tens or hundreds of people, that doesn't make any difference either way. What I would what I would look at is um, how 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 we discover books. You are you might you might just be walking in a bookshop and you might find something but i think the chances are actually you hear about a book and and you you check it out and and that's how you do it i don't think there is a podcast discoverability problem i think there is a an understanding of so uh, i was i was on a twitter spaces uh thing a couple of days ago and, and I, I brought this up and i'll try and do a better job of, of explaining it than i did then that i think so when I when I was finishing uni, we were still kind of in slightly old media thing, you know. Like I like I did six weeks of TV 
live like live tv production to learn how that's done i did six weeks of journalism i did six weeks of live radio uh production to to understand how you know you make these kind of terrestrial formats if you like these linear formats and one of the things that you also do for six weeks is there's like a career thing uh where they help you go out and understand and navigate the world of 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 jobs and, and how you might um go out and actually get get paid to do this thing that you've just studied but the thing with TV and radio and, and those those sort of media is that they have inbuilt networks within them. They have ecosystems, whether it's commercial radio within a network, like a large network like Global, or it's a local radio station where you can move from one station to another. You know, Maybe you start in hospital radio and you can navigate around. There are these sort of spaces, you know, the, the BBC is a thing, it's, a, it's a, a space that you can navigate around, you can network within, and you can find out how stuff gets commissioned and meet people and shadow people and do all these things that we don't have in podcasting. Because of the, the sc- sort of scrappy upstart nature of it, is we don't we don't have those things uh, and because the money entered fairly late into it there hasn't been that sort of okay this is how we do things um even even sort of forgetting the the algorithm side so what happens is we learn how to make the thing because we can learn that easily enough and like you said you know there's there's courses free courses you can pay for like buzz sprout the hosting company has a really stellar how to get started in podcasting course great like, if you're strapped for cash, go do that course because it will tell you everything you need to know to get started. And they will tell you a little bit about growth and a little bit about marketing, but they, they can't help you navigate the space in terms of what we think of as this discoverability problem. And and it, it's calling it a discoverability problem, I think, puts the onus on apps and other ecosystems, whereas actually we need to understand, and it is understandable, we need to understand how to work within, how to work with tastemakers, how to work so that we can make word of mouth work in our favour. So that's finding newsletters that are uh, adjacent to your topic and speaking to them as a new podcast uh, is launched. And not just podcast newsletters, but newsletters in your topic, in your niche to say, you know, I, I think this will be of interest. Come and give it a give it a try. You know, guesting on other podcasts is is another one. So it's being part of the ecosystem. That is how you can help spread word of mouth. And so discoverability is. I think we use it because it's a nice shorthand. But I actually don't think there there is a problem. It's the the problem is in education. Is is helping people understand. Have made the thing. Now what do I do with it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, my opinion is, yeah, kind of not so much that discovery is the issue, because, I mean, I, I know of dozens of podcasts that if that was the only thing left, I'd more than happily listen to it. I think the thing for me is immediacy. It's why should I stop mm. my listening patterns and listen to your podcast right now or tonight when I go out for a walk or in the car tomorrow or whatever. It's it's that kind of why should I stop everything and listen to yours? And, you know, that's that's a huge thing to try and get across to, to a potential listener is that, you know, your dozen podcasts that you have on rotation, you, you arguably have to drop one or make a conscious effort mm-hmm. to try something new. And you know, that's a huge leap that needs to be made. It is. And and I, 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 as much as I've sort of said, you know, discoverability, I don't know, um, there is an interface problem that, that apps uh, specifically could make a lot easier. Uh, I think... To a degree, as much as a lot of people have sort of moved away from from Apple Podcasts because they've defined a little more clearly what they want to be for, which is more sort of casual listening. Um, finding better ways that you can easily preview a podcast, and I don't necessarily just mean like hitting a button to preview, but actually say, okay, I want to check out this episode, but I also want to know that it's so, sort of sitting somewhere in my library so that I'm, I'm ready to come back to it or I can subscribe to it. There aren't really good ways of being able to trial a podcast out. You sort of have to follow it and subscribe to it and then play an episode in, in many cases. And so there are big open goals there that would help but I, I don't think we we can't rely on those or, uh, on those companies or those developers to uh, put the ball in the goal. I don't know. <laughs> we can't rely on those to to solve those problems. Um, we have to work within the constraints of the medium that we have and use what we have got to our advantage. Um, because yeah, th- there are these problems and they have existed for a long time. You know, I was. I, I started a movement with a friend of mine um, and we got a couple of big wigs 
interested in that they raised an, an eyebrow over email to make a link. Uh, like a, so, uh, in 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 email, if you're on a website and you uh, you see an email address and it's highlighted, you can click it, and that's that's because it has a special kind of link that starts with mail to and then a colon and then the full email address. Your computer understands or your phone understands if a if a an, a link that I click or tap, if it begins with mail to m i a m i yeah mail to colon and then the email address, I know that my default email app. I can open that app and compose a new message and put the email address in the in the to line. We don't have that for podcasting. And so I, I thought, you know, we need a, like a pod to link. So pod to slash and then, you know, a link to the, the feed of the podcast. And then your computer or your phone would say, whatever my default podcasting app is, now that doesn't exist, but let's assume that one did. Whatever my default podcasting app is, open the podcast in that app and, and let me go. And that doesn't solve the discoverability, but what it does remove is some of that friction. And and that's what I'd like to see more of. I'd like to see more friction removed from the space so that people who aren't ardent pod fans can get more discoverability. And that's where Spotify is really good at. Uh, that's what, what Spotify is really good at. I can... Um, mash my head against the keyboard on, on the Spotify thing and come up with a podcast and hit play and I'm listening to it straight away and Spotify will now remember that's a show I listen to and so I can find it back in, in my library later managing that as like a power listener as like someone who listens to lots of podcasts isn't great but if I'm you know if I'm a new casual listener and I'm excited or, or I'm, I don't even care that much but someone said this might be something you would enjoy I know that I can type that into Spotify and I can find it and I can listen to it straight away and so that kind of stuff removing the friction I think I would like to see a lot more of um, and there are people like th- those who work in, in podcasting 2.0 that are kind of trying to do things um they are focused on, on other aspects, um, but I would lo- yeah, I would love to see more more friction removed because it would make everybody's lives easier, possibly apart from some of the larger platforms, which is why you know <laughs> there's not a lot of motivation. I mean, talking about discoverability stuff, it still kind of amazes me that some people will have a podcast and you know they'll have a Twitter account to pro- to promote it, and they'll say things like, "Get it wherever you get your podcasts." You know, not not even a link to. Apple and Spotify, you know, if you just kept it that simple, you know, it'll literally be, we've got a podcast. If you want to listen to it, go to your app, type it in yeah. search, find it, then then download, and you know that kind of amazes me. But you know the horrible the horrible thing about that is, with the way that social media sites run, and I, I as you know, as you are, you know, you understand the web uh, and and have them for a long time. Same here. We want links because that's we know that's the currency of the web. That's what it's built on. But social media apps hate links. They don't want you to link to things because you're taking... And it sounds like a cynical, like, almost chemtrails, like, conspiracy theory thing, but it isn't. Um, links take the attention away from the app and they want to keep the attention in the app. Um, and so it actually, unfortunately, makes good solid algorithmic sense to have a podcast promote it and not actually link to it um because the app will reward you for doing that it will reward you if you use images instead of links or video or little audio clips if your social network supports it those things keep the attention within the app um and i I, and it is a horrible thing as as people who love the idea that the web is this exploratory place that we can leapfrog from site to site to site and even from app to app to app, using app links, that that's a thing that we can do. I love that, and I wish, you know, we we weren't in the space that we are. But the fact is, that is the space again. Like that's the constraint that we have to play uh, play around. And I've spent a lot of time raging against the dying of the light, being angry at these systems that already exist, and going nowhere because you can't you can't fight those systems. So the best way, if you want to, you know, if you want people to. Um, to enjoy your stuff is is to play within the you know with play by the rules of the ecosystem in as much as it then allows you to you know to sleep at night if you feel gross by using 20,000 hashtags in a tweet like I do then maybe don't do that but also know that yeah you will actually probably get more traction if you use an image 
or a video than if you link to something. In, in terms of best practice within podcasts, I mean, example, I'll say, you know, this is hopefully, you know, depending on when I get edited out, episode three of Making Creative <laughs> Depay. Uh, depending Depends on how hard a job I've made for so, you in the edit. <laughs> yeah, so episode two is recorded and being edited. But as an example, it's probably about an hour I was length. So, you know, again, you know, another of the classic questions is how long should my podcast be and all that kind of stuff. Mm. There's always a trade off there. You know, if I spend six hours editing that down to 35 minutes, mm. um, but three people listen to it, you know, that, there's no point in that. But again, if you don't spend the time and make it tighter, then it's a lot harder to kind of keep listeners. And there's always that balance of, you know, do you just do, should you from the start almost kind of build the best product or don't bother? Or should you just be rough and ready and kind of not get too hung up on making it perfect? That's a great question. I think rough and ready, rough and ready, actually, like the how you achieve that or how you get to like a minimum viable, decent sounding thing has got a lot easier. If you're prepared to, and again, like it comes back to intention and, and like how much, what you're expecting and hoping to get out of what is either a hobby or what is a business, you know, money-making strategy for you. If you're prepared to spend, I can't remember what it is, $12, $15 a month, you can pay for an app like Descript and you can make your editing life far, far easier and turn what might be a six-hour job into, um, for an hour podcast, maybe a two-hour job, maybe a two-and-a-half-hour job because of the nature of the way it works. So you can achieve something that might not be perfect, but it's a, a, a lot better. And you can do that from, from day one without actually knowing a lot about audio. And I think that's great because it allows, you know, more people to actually get get their stuff out. I think it's it's not as simple as just, you know, making a great thing, obviously. Consistency is is, is important and it's that consistency of, of showing up that is really valuable i think and it's difficult because we often go into a new project not with not really with a sense of how long it's actually going to take to crank one of these episodes out and and then you know you you get to the point where you realize you've spent two days on this the the point i would sort of pick up on is when you said like spending six and a half hours editing an episode and only three people listen so why bother okay yeah there's a few few, few questions i could ask about that. but the one thing i would say is and I, it's something I forget a lot is, okay, this episode right now, this week, this 30-day period, maybe it got three listens. But what about in six months' time? What about what happens when your show becomes popular or builds up enough of a head of steam where people want to go through your back catalogue? I see it with mine. You know, I, I had a, I have a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy podcast stunt, standing started from a standing start um you know we didn't i didn't have a mailing list to to tell i had a few people who i knew liked hitchhikers and and i I could tell them about it but we really started from nothing and we tried lots of little scrappy upstart methods to to gain a bit of traction and we scrambled around in ages and we complained for ages about how we had this lovely show and not enough people were listening and then slowly people started to listen to it and that took a couple of years of working consistently you know we we had some breaks but we put out an episode every week uh we put out 60 odd in um i don't know it was about 18 months two years which is not super consistent but you know it it was enough and we got a little bit of of help because we got on the bbc's radar that wasn't until 2020 after doing after starting in in 2017 and we'd already actually finished the show by then but you know we we got on on their radar and they featured us and that gave us a little bit more of a lift but we yeah we started from 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 pretty much nothing and we now get to the point where we don't have you know thousands and thousands if we were more consistent we absolutely would because we could build up that head of steam but you know we we just haven't been and so it is i think it as much as i've said consistency like it really is a long game it really is. And you have to toil for quite a while in obscurity. But if I look at my stats, to, to like really go back to your, your initial question, if I look at my stats, the one of the most popular episodes or one of the most highly downloaded episodes is our first one because people 
like the idea of they know they can start from the beginning and they want to they want to find out like if they like the show and so your your episode that began with three listeners so why bother now becomes your starting point three years on and and you go back to that and think oh bloody hell should i maybe update that episode now um you know so yeah <laughs> very long answer to a, to a simple question as ever no oh, absolutely no that's fine yeah I, I kind of feel that with mine you know Stuart was a who was on an episode one was a great guest um i almost feel that's kind of too good to push now because there's nothing else around it <laughs> so you know i kind of want to wait until i've got a bit more of a body work and then yes. do a bit more with it because otherwise you'll go oh that was good and then well there's nothing else and it fades away and so yes it's a difficult balance i mean luckily enough a bit like yours you know there, there's nothing particularly time sensitive in that so it, yeah. it was probably about six months ago and i think it's it's more or less as relevant now no i i, I think i think that is huge uh I, I i actually feel kind of sorry for people uh, you know sympathy or empathy for people who who do shows that are really reliant on like the the latest events you know whether it's in their industry or whatever um because yeah that stuff doesn't it isn't as evergreen you know my hitchhiker's show we were chronic we were talking about every proper noun that douglas adams created from literally from a to z that's what we did we put everything in order and started from a to z that's that you know it sorry the the guy's not alive so he's not making any more uh, and we only covered the you know the douglas adams books so we we you know we know that that's the case now in in a year's time or whenever it ships we're waiting for the netflix the proposed netflix hitchhiker's show um and that will change the nature of the show then because we'll be talking about something week by week and will it have the same longevity um and and so yeah i think the 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 sort of the evergreen stuff you know if it's advice make it advice that is that is not trend based you know that is sort of just good solid advice that stands the test of time you know if you're talking about fashions then um you know like i i edit a a, a podcast that's about um dressing up and talks about fashion but it's not talking about what is the latest fashion um and it allows those episodes to be revisited so yeah i i i really do think that that those initial episodes um they're the hardest they fe- they you feel that um that lack of interest so keenly to begin with but then after a while you start to realize like actually you know maybe maybe that is the starting point that, that, that people are enjoying and it is worth it it is worth putting the effort in um i think as much as you can sustain it though you know it's, as much as it's manageable for you as a human being and as much as you can put the time in i think do it but yeah in terms of i mean you kind of mentioned about kind of refreshing content and editing it and we talked about dynamic ad style, dynamic content mm. do you think there's be there be, seems to have been a bit of a a leap forward in the last six to 12 months on that about what can be done do you think there's going to be a lot more of that and just the more hobbyist podcaster is going to get more into that kind of thing as well i hope so so there's a couple of companies that are making that easier uh so the 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 technology that has existed since it for as long as the mp3 because what what we're talking about is this ability that you can stitch bits of mp3s together and create a a human centipede of mp3s title that that is then the 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 way that some of these big companies work at scale is they say oh we can see that this person is downloading uh this this mp3 file we know there's an ad coming up right now instead of instead of delivering the the stream for that mp3 let's switch over and deliver this ad put this ad in at this point and then continue with the with the rest of the mp3 stream so what that means is you can do that differently for different listeners around the world so you can have the same content delivered everywhere but the ad is stitched in um there could be an ad that is for tesco in the uk or it could be for walmart in the us depending on where you are and when you've specifically downloaded the episode at that particular time because the uh for the most part with these big services that stitching is is actually happening when you request the file that that usually happens for the kinds of ads where i'm talking about like tesco and walmart where they're not part of your show really they're they're just they're injected in they don't really feel part of your organic content 
and that's uh, you know the company Acast have have done that for a long while. You uh, you might hear that little tone that goes do 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 do, and then there's an ad. That's Acast telling you this bit is not actually like the the creator of the show didn't have any control over this bit. Don't consider this you know their opinion this is an advert and then it goes do 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 and then you resume the content right so that's acast helping the listener understand relatively recently i had a great example you know where we're talking about dynamic ads versus dynamic content listening to um blind boy podcast so mm-hmm. at the start of that he has a little introduction where he's talking about a show he's doing but that show happened two years ago say so you know that bit is is out of date and then following that there's an advert a host read that he reads for beer 52 but that beer 52 mm-hmm. ad is the latest one it's current so, so you yeah. kind of think you know there's there's certainly a, a trick being missed i think for content creators where you know that that initial ramble at the start relates to kind of what's new now and you just overwrite all your historical yes. ones so Captivate, uh, which is a, a company uh, based in the UK that, that do podcast hosting, they've introduced this thing called the Ad Painter. And what this is, is you can take your existing back catalogue. And if you've got something like that, where you've said, hey, I'm going to be uh, in uh, d- doing a show, uh, or I've got a book launch or whatever, uh, come out and, and see me. And that's in an episode from a year ago. You can literally sort of drag your mouse cursor across that bit of the waveform and say, replace this with a more relevant ad if one exists in the library um and so you can record those and i'm now doing something similar with my own podcast um where i do i have a couple of ad slots if you like and one of them is an ad for a you know a a free product and then the other one is timely uh it's about my community but i talk about either what's happened this week in the community or I talk about uh, upcoming events, depending on, on which is more interesting or whatever. And so what that then means to anyone who's listening, if they listen to an evergreen episode from a few months ago, they will be getting up to the minute information about the events uh, that I'm running this week. Um, and so that's all based on ad technology, but it is Im- implemented now and implementable in much more creative ways. And if this is of interest to, to anyone listening, if you want to get into this th- stuff, then I would um, recommend soundsprofitable.com. So Brian Barletta is a guy who writes a lot about ad tech, and some of it can be used for evil, but uh, so much of it can be used for good. And there's so much interesting stuff that can be done outside of advertising, just making your show much more relevant and more you know interesting. And there are even ways that you can do this that aren't, advertising that you can say hey um i know that you're listening to this on apple podcasts or spotify now it would be great if you gave us a five star review and then you could do something for another app like someone's listening in google podcasts you can record a segment that says hey you're listening in google podcasts i thanks <laughs> I don't know. um you know you're listening in overcast hey you're listening in overcast you've got an iphone could you nip over to the apple app and just give me a five star rating and then you can come back you don't have to let subscribe but we'd appreciate it because it helps us that kind of stuff that's not advertising but it is ways they are ways that you can sort of do interesting things using that technology for good and so yeah th- that kind of stuff as a tech guy i i'm really excited by that and and i am using it not just in my own podcast but i'm also helping sort of clients get to grips with it as well and 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 there's a lot of my clients like they might have a book or a or a training thing or a course that they're going to deliver and for them to be able to to take their back catalog and say before the episode starts i just want to let you know uh, i'm running a course deadline is this date and then once that deadline's hit we get rid of the ad done we haven't got to re-upload the episodes it's just you know that kind of stuff is great and i'd like more people to to play with that kind of stuff it takes a bit of time to do it elegantly so that it doesn't sound clumsy but it's worth it i think so you were saying then about using technology for good and you know, ad- advertising <laughs> so i mean ad tech for good ad yeah tech for good yeah so i mean example for that not necessarily for bad but whether it's overstepping the line as some adverts you know it's talking about my local asda and it's it's close. Mm-hmm. It's not far off because you know, with any sure. of this kind of geolocation, it's never perfect. But you know, telling me about my 
new pizza counter opened at um, Dunstable Asda. You know, is is that taking it too far? And there's always this kind of thing in kind of any kind of advertising where you want personalization, but you don't necessarily want the customer to know you're personalizing it. Or is, <laughs> is there, there's a difficult balance. Yeah, my my view on this. I don't know. Like, I'm I'm not this. This is I'm not saying this is the right view at all. This is just my my particular take. Is that I'm actually not that bothered by that stuff because they they can know where I am and they can you know they can even know my habits. They can even connect it to a to a cookie. I, I'd rather they didn't, but that's fine. Like, they don't know that I am like. I think we sometimes think of 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 this almost like that scene at the end of um. Is it the dark? Is it the Dark Knight? Uh, one of the one of the Batman's, one of the Batman, where he's got this huge view of Gotham City on all these different monitors, and we, I think, we kind of think that there's this sort of, you know, there's this these these people that are looking at what we're doing, and it, no, there isn't. Like no one's looking at a spreadsheet going. John Smith, who lives at 17 Acacia Avenue, likes fish and chips and these things. Like, it's all aggregated. And again, like, I know that's not everybody's view, but that's why I don't worry too much about that. I know that pe- people do. And there are legitimate concerns about companies knowing the kinds of podcasts you listen to if you are in a climate where that might not feel safe. If you are in... And this can be taken to to uh, an nth degree as any as any argument can. But you know, if you're in a a country where homosexuality is a, is is illegal, and you are listening to uh, a podcast that supports um, that supports you and your beliefs and your and you know, and and you live in an authoritarian state, then that puts you in danger, and that identifiable information of your IP address might put you in danger. And that's where I do think, you know, as much as I'm not necessarily a flag waving sort of privacy advocate, we do need to think about that because those are, those are legitimate things that it's worth us bearing in mind that, um, yeah, I worry less about it in terms of the ad tech stuff because, you know, I've got, I've got like so many, um, Amazon, lady in tube devices that's the you know where where I'm I'm doing various things um they make my life easier I like turning on the lights and stuff I don't know that they know that much about my shopping habits except for yes I've got an Amazon account I don't feel intruded upon it doesn't try and sell me anything so yeah like I understand people's concerns with it but I don't know I've, I've yet to to feel really bothered and also I kind of do genuinely think the more that the more that these companies understand about us, the more relevant those ads become. And Instagram's actually got pretty good at this. Um, I, you know, I I buy stuff off Instagram because Instagram is starting to know my tastes a little bit, and and I I know I'm not un- unique in that regard. The the fact that we can tailor these ads, it you know, it introduces us to things that that we um, we might not otherwise be introduced to and also us as creators who want to get our work out it also gives us avenues you know i'm using facebook ads for something to support my my business but i could you know i have used ads you know i could i if i wanted i could try running a spotify ad or a facebook ad to advertise my uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy podcast i could work with with acast to produce a little segment that goes into people's podcast apps and i wouldn't necessarily pay that much for it and i can do that choosing well i know it's probably going to be blokes in their 40s <laughs> who will like this whereas my business is is pitched very differently and so like yeah i i kind of think again like i'm not trying to explicitly find joe schlop who lives at this address i'm just looking for people who share these interests and i, I kind of think that's fine Moving back to some of the technical stuff, I mean, I think one of the first things I saw from you on on Twitter and on the web was um, Podcode. Mm-hmm. So where it was effectively you could kind of choose your own podcast. So you had various sections, you could tick the bits you want, and then that would build a bespoke podcast for you, right? which I thought was really cool bit of technology. Can you talk about kind of how you built that and yeah, 
what you have and haven't learned yeah um i love that so podcode is is a website that that is my sort of blog and it's my repository of knowledge for for everything that i know about podcasting that i'm sort of building up and that's where my courses live and all that kind of stuff what i did over the summer is i was experimenting with lots of different things really i was throwing lots of things against the wall to see what stuck and uh, this was loads of fun to do but it didn't really stick so what i built was exactly as as you've described is a podcast that you could subscribe to where you could build your own so it was all podcasting news but some of it would be about growth about how to grow your podcast some of it would be about the craft of editing your podcast some of it would be about how you start a podcast so if you because i had a newsletter uh, subscription list most of those have already started a podcast they don't need the content about starting a podcast most of them want the growth stuff and most of them probably don't want industry news but a few might and so what I built is a system that allowed me to, because I still have the, the system that trawls lots of different websites and tries, um, sort of fairly naively, but it works most of the time. It tries to sort of find relevant articles and put them in a database for me to just tick through and say, yes, I'm going to talk about that one. No, like most of them, you know, are not relevant, but I'll find a few and go, yep, okay, I'm going to talk about those and I'll tag them. And it went into, I built this this system where I had like a, a newsreader app and it was just a little web app um, that would pick these things that I hadn't yet recorded audio for and I would sit here at my desk with my microphone have my script it would literally just be because I'd, I'd write a quick blurb about the the article beforehand and sometimes I could just do that on my sofa while I'm just trawling through and quick summary of the article save that for later come at my desk sit down this app would then give me here are all of the things that I need to read and it, I would record little audio files for each one of those and, and it was sort of fairly easy. So I have a, a, a simple recording app here, one button click, one button click again to stop and drag the file into the uh, into the system. And the code I wrote would go off and do a load of things like it would try and make sure that the levels were consistent. If there was a bit of, because there would always be a little bit of silence at the end because I'm then mousing over and clicking the button again. So I wanted to remove all of those bits and just like punch up the audio and all that kind of stuff. And then, and all those little chunks would be stored in a database and tagged for like this is about planning this is about growth this is about industry and you as a subscriber to the podcast you had your own custom feed based on the tags that you were interested in and so it would deliver the same intro to everybody uh, and the same outro to everybody and a couple of the other segments would probably be you know be for everybody but then there would be uh you would only get the bits that were relevant to you um if you subscribe to the public feed which everybody got uh then you would get the top uh i don't know five stories or whatever it was that i that i determined rather than you didn't get everything but you would get you know a certain number that was yeah that that was really fun and and really easy to do uh because stitching mp3 files together is is a pretty easy task i went as as the kids say ham on it in that you know i built chapters around it uh the show notes were all dynamically built they all had links to everything that was discussed the the intro was you know felt a little bit personalized because it said hey you know thanks for listening to this personalized version of the podcast you can if you want to customize what you get then you can find the link in the show notes and then the public version that was like on apple podcasts and spotify would say thanks for listening to this generic version of the show if you want to get a customized version with only the stuff you care about then go to podco.co slash whatever and yeah it was really fun to put that together and I only stopped because it was like it, this isn't the work I need to be doing because there's other people who do who curate podcast news really well and um, there's no point trying to compete with those because I, I don't need to like that's, that's not what I'm trying to do so it, it was loads of fun and I, I, somewhere the code exists for that and um, I might do something like that again at some point I think there's there's some really nice ideas about it I even had the idea which still kind of a little bit i'm not married to it but i'm certainly holding hands with it is having a podcast network that is based on everybody does this so everybody has a briefing so it was called the podcode briefing everybody has a briefing about a subject they care about be it how you make creativity pay or be it your local football team or whatever and you subscribe to the ones you want but then like people can share segments so if there's something about making creativity pay that's a story about how a football team sold an nft 
then you might swap those two stories together. And that feels really cool. You have this really interesting podcast that's built out of lots of different shows. And I, lo- you know, the technologist in me loves all that stuff and how to make it sound good and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's not, it's not the work I should be doing, but it's so much fun. <laughs> the, the possibilities that sound fantastic. So, you know, you could say, let's take football clubs, you know, 92 league clubs. You might be interested in just one division or one team or one team per division and all that kind of stuff you kind of say right so i want to hear about blah 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 and blah and that's all you get yeah. so somewhere there is a podcast that talks about every football team and all the matches and some people want the the two hour in-depth stuff and some people just want three minutes about their team and don't care about anything else absolutely uh, the, yeah i can imagine there being a huge kind of possibilities it, it's yeah it's there's so much potential and i think that's one of the things that we will get to play with a lot more I, and I hope there are more people who are up for experimenting in, in that way because yeah uh, I, I hope we discover more about what's possible with audio as well and like audio learning because one of the other things I'm I'm interested in is and I think I can't remember who it was someone has bought out I don't think it was Spotify but someone has bought out a company that we're basically doing masterclass but in audio form um and I love the potential of that. I love the idea of taking a course while I'm walking uh, my local canal because I sometimes I'll go off for a walk and that's you know maybe two hours and I'm often listening to a podcast but or sometimes an audio book. What if I could be consuming a really well made course and then at the end of it I come home, I look at my phone and here's a bunch of homework for the course because it knows what the, the bits that I've listened to, like that kind of stuff geared towards non-visual based learning, geared towards, yeah, okay, your mind might be very slightly occupied with putting one front of the other, one foot in front of the other, but you're absorbing this knowledge and then you come home and then you can sort of cement that knowledge by taking a quiz or whatever, like that kind of stuff. I think companies, larger companies are understanding more and more about what audio can do. The social audio boom that we saw last year Twitter spaces, I think, you know, is, is a real thing, whereas Clubhouse is not so much. And if Facebook ever get their thing off the ground, I mean, you know, there's all there's these these possibilities that show us that outside of, like, if you like, capital P podcasting, there's still a lot of interest in, in audio. And the way I think about it is in the human voice, because it's so persuasive, because we are hardwired from an early age to respond to the human voice, even before we understand language. It's like one of the first things we hear is, is the human voice. And the more that we understand how powerful that is and how amazing what we can do with that and how it can make us feel and what it can teach us. Yeah, that's the stuff that, that sort of gives me goosebumps, really. Just to finish up, the reason we kind of got together was your Guest 52 yeah, kind of aim for, for the year. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about that and how it's gone so far and what you hope to get from yeah. it? Yeah, it's kind of a loose a loose plan, uh, a loose aim um, to try and um, it's, it's given me a framework really to just get on as many podcasts as possible because I love, you know, having these kind of conversations and it's what I would recommend for anyone in, in a creative field who wants to make their, their stuff more visible is is to be on relevant, um, interesting podcasts. And so Guest 52 is this idea that I would try and be on one podcast a week, uh, at least so that they average out for the, for the year. So uh, yeah, I've got a few booked in. I need to actually sit and be more proactive in reaching out to other people rather than hoping that they'll come to me but yeah it's it's fun and i'm hoping it will uh, uh it'll pan out and just allow me to meet more people as well you know huge thanks to mark for his time and great answers you can find mark on twitter at mark steadman and podcode website with loads of tips and guides about podcasting at podcode.co and there's also a range of other links in the show notes thank you for listening if you enjoyed this check out some of our other episodes where we talk about making creativity pay in comedy writing and lots more